Hello, you're watching Low Batteries, a look at video games and mental health. This week's episode is a slight deviation from the norm in that the main topic isn't actually classed as a mental health disorder. Instead, it's a fact of life. Something pretty much everyone can expect to go through at some point. Just because it's a ubiquitous experience, however, doesn't make it any less affecting. It can still be hugely disruptive to one's normal way of life, as well as being extremely painful. I'm talking, of course, about grief. Grief is probably one of the most heavily explored themes in video games today. Think of a few video games at random and you'll almost certainly run into a character who has lost someone, or will lose someone, over the course of the game. But the thing is, more often than not, the death of these loved ones, that loss, gets utilised as a way to spur the character, or characters, into greater action. Here are a couple of examples. Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor, which is an excellent game, starts out with a brief bit of exposition showing how happy Talion, our hero, is with his wife Lorith and son Durell. Very soon after, however, we see them being sacrificed by the Black Hand of Sauron, who is trying to summon the spirit of Celebrimbor, the elf lord and legendary builder. Something goes awry, however, and Celebrimbor fuses with Talion, making him half man, half wraith. Thus begins Talion's quest for vengeance. Assassin's Creed 2, meanwhile, starts out showing how happy Ezio Auditore is as a lustful youth in Renaissance Italy. Until, that is, his father and brother fall victim to a political conspiracy and are hanged before his very eyes. Thus begins Ezio's quest for vengeance. I'll kill you for what you've done! The grief Talion and Ezio experience is powerful, yes, but it doesn't really fall in line with the experience 99% of people will have when dealing with the same emotions. For one thing, most people don't find grief a useful experience. Quite the opposite, in fact. But grief fills these characters with a righteous, productive fury. It makes them energised, and in many ways, it makes them complete. Grief gives them the sense of purpose and identity they didn't know they were lacking, allowing their character concepts to fully mature. Ezio, after all, seems like just a boy until he steps into the assassin's robes when suddenly he's a man capable of, in fact destined for, greatness. That's not to say there's anything necessarily wrong with that kind of narrative. Indeed, it's an overwhelmingly common one in video games, film, TV, music, literature, even folklore. But, as I said briefly earlier, these depictions of grief as an immediate, empowering catalyst for personal growth don't really reflect the experiences we're likely to have when dealing with grief ourselves. Experiencing grief can instigate personal growth, of course, but it's simply… not that easy. Thankfully, while a lot of games use grief as a bit of set dressing, there are others that do engage with mourning in a more meaningful way. To the Moon is a game in which you go backwards through a dying man's memories to see how he lived, changing one thing to satisfy his final wish. The Unfinished Swan tells the story of a boy coming to accept the loss of his mother, and then of course there's that dragon Cancer, a game about a couple's real-life experiences from the moment of their son's cancer diagnosis to his eventual death. There's also Life is Strange, a game I feel we discuss a lot in Low Batteries. In Life is Strange, Chloe's character is defined by the grief, or some might say her inability to deal with the grief she feels for her father. Depending on the choices you make throughout the game, it's also possible to see what it's like when a teenager at a school dies suddenly, and how that death impacts the community as a whole. I found this part of the game particularly powerful, as it's a pretty accurate representation. A friend of mine died a few weeks into our final year at school, which was one of the most awful experiences of my life, but it was amazing to see how it brought everyone closer together. Suddenly, all these stories were coming out of the woodwork from people I didn't even know were close to him, and I think Life is Strange captured that sense pretty perfectly. If there's one game that really stands out as a good example of the depiction of grief, though, it's Brothers A Tale of Two Sons. <laughs> A Tale of Two Sons starts with the younger of two brothers, Nai, who is clearly still grieving for the loss of his mother in a boating accident, a death for which he blames himself. It quickly transpires Nai's father is gravely ill and, along with his older brother Naya, he has to travel to the Tree of Life and collect the healing water held within its branches, a monumental task by any standard, but considerably harder while also grieving. The controls, at first, feel clunky and alien. Each brother is controlled by one of the analogue sticks, which at first is hard to wrap your head around. 
Whether intentional or not, this difficulty really resonated with me. It felt hard to do the most normal things, which is also true of the grieving process. When first starting to process the death of a loved one, it feels strange, wrong almost, to be doing ordinary things and carrying on. Very quickly though, as you learn to control the brothers in tandem, you get a sense of how strongly they rely on each other, and how important support is while grieving. Naya, the older brother, is more stoic, putting on a show of strength to bolster Nai, but because there are areas he can't reach but his brother can, you still get the sense that he needs him. Being younger, Nai is more vulnerable, but he's also capable of snatching a greater sense of joy from those rare moments in which it's offered up. Seeing the pleasure he takes in paddling in a stream, stacked up against the more functional response of his older brother, for instance, you get a comforting sense that this child, who has been through so much, still has the capacity to feel happy. It's a glimmer of hope during an awful time, a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Accordingly, during my playthrough, I found myself actively looking for these moments in which I might be able to let Nai have some fun. If there was something interesting to interact with, I wanted him to be the one to do it, in the hopes it might push back the sense of anguish that was surrounding him. Because if there's one thing that really makes Brothers A Tale Of Two Sons powerful, it's that the grief used to establish the game isn't just shown off, then forgotten, as with Assassin's Creed 2 and Shadow Of Mordor. It's not a means to an end, it informs the entire game. Early on, for instance, you have to cross a large body of water, which, for Nai, is a painful reminder of his mother's death. He's initially unable to get in the water until Naya agrees to ferry him across on his back. It's a very brief moment, one designed to introduce a new gameplay mechanic, but it's also a powerfully layered exploration of grief, because grief can be both opportunistic and debilitating. When grieving, it's often so hard to predict when something is going to bring the full weight of your loss down on your head. And when it does hit you like that, out of the blue, it's really hard to keep going. The pain felt in that moment is increased by the element of surprise. At those points, having others around you can be immeasurably helpful. Even if it doesn't stop that grief from hurting, it can at least help you carry on. <sighs> There are several moments like this punctuated throughout Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, for instance when the boys come across a house that's burned to the ground. A man who has seemingly lost his wife and child in the blaze attempts to hang himself as the boys arrive before collapsing into despair. If you skirt around the rock edge nearby and get into the house, it's possible to recover a music box which, when given to the man, gives him a small amount of comfort. It doesn't cure him of his grief, of course, but it does at least stabilise him, which, given the urgency of their quest, is about all Naya and Nai can do for him. This moment is pretty extreme, but it's also a fairly frank appraisal of what it's like to help someone who is grieving. One may not be able to do much, but what little can be done often makes a big difference to the person trying to fight through their grief. There's so much more I could say about Brothers A Tale of Two Sons and why it's such a poignant exploration of grief, but really, playing the game will get that message across to you much more effectively than I ever could. If you haven't already played it, I implore you to. Brothers is a fantastic exploration of grief, not just because it's about persevering through the grieving process, but because it fully acknowledges just how painful that process can be. It makes it clear that grieving can be absolute agony, where other games make it seem more like some kind of energy drink. Of course, as is so often the point I want to make on low batteries, a game doesn't have to be specifically about a problem or an emotional state in order to help with one. As with illnesses like depression and anxiety, video games can be a useful support tool for people who are suffering from grief. Here's an example. Last year, my grandfather died. My brother called to tell me the news, and I happened to be playing Elite Dangerous at the time. It was a Saturday morning. I found myself staring at the screen as I tried to absorb what I'd just been told. I'm big on exploration in Elite Dangerous, so I was just flying around a small solar system and mapping it out so I could sell the cartographic data later on. My ship was still cruising toward a distant planet as I thought about quitting out of the game. Somehow it felt disrespectful to keep playing when I'd just learned of the death of a loved one. Nonetheless, something kept me there. I kept flying through the quiet expanse of space toward this distant object, and I kept gazing at the screen. As I waited to get close enough to this planet for my scanner to kick in and tell me what I was looking at, I held the fact my grandfather was dead in my mind. I can't remember how long I played for now, but for a time I just floated in my ship, slowly feeling around the edges of my grief as it formed inside me. 
I felt like I was uncovering my grief as I coloured in this little corner of the galaxy in my ship, trying to make sense of things. I was upset, certainly, but there was something about the experience that was somehow serene. I felt able to examine my grief in a way that was lacking from the handful of other bereavements I've suffered over the course of my life. Whenever I think about my grandfather dying, I'm taken back to that moment, not the last time I saw him. In that moment, I was able to acknowledge I had a journey ahead of me, one that would require me to seek help from others, but also offer it to the rest of my family. It was pure coincidence, but somehow having that time to float in space made it easier to get started. Anyway, that's enough from me. I hope you found this episode of Low Batteries interesting. Please do check out the others if you're interested in hearing more about video games and mental health. As ever, if you think you or someone you know is suffering, don't carry on in silence. You can find links to mental health resources in the description of this video. Thanks for watching, and take care.